Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Dickinson, and I will be the moderator for tonight's uh, City Council Candidate Forum. Tonight's City Council Candidate Forum is sponsored by St. Paul Strong, which is an organization devoted to open and transparent public processes. And Strong stands for Safety, Trust, Responsible, open neighborhoods for generations. There are gonna be three different forums tonight. The first one will be for Ward 4, 5, the second one will be for Ward 6, and the third one will be for Ward 7. We're gonna to start tonight by having all of the candidates introduce themselves, and I wanted to let everyone know that all candidates who had filed for election were invited more than once to come. So the folks who are here are ones who could be here and who wanted to be here. So I'm gonna start with my left and I'm just gonna ask all the candidates first, just introduce themselves and then I'll ask the first question. Anin Buju, Indigenous Cas. Hello everyone, my name is Bob Blake and I just said uh, hello to you in my native language which is the Red Lake Ojibwe. Hi, my name is Jamie Hendricks um, and I live in the north end of Ward 5 Hi, I'm Suyapa Miranda, and I also live in the north end of, of our ward as well. So the first question is just a general question, which is to ask each of them, what is their vision for their city and their ward, and what are their top priorities should they be elected to office? And I will start at the opposite end and work our way here. Sure. So. In thinking about our ward and what we can do best, is it really, I envision us making it more economically sound as it sits right now, and it hasn't been that specifically in the North End. Um, and in that vision, really joining us together, I feel like our whole ward seems so fragmented throughout the years, and it's really time for us to build our, unite us and put us back together. Thank you. Um, my vision for Ward 5 is for us to be able to have safe neighborhoods, for us to be able to um, move um, within our neighborhoods well, um, to be, be able to bring more small businesses into our neighborhoods. Um, my top priorities are safe neighborhoods, infrastructure such as our roads, and housing stability. Uh, my vision for Ward 5 is job training. Uh, workforce Development Center down at Maryland Avenue Kmart. There's a reason why that Kmart was the number one, one of the number one Kmarts in the nation, uh, because it's right in the middle in the concentration of poverty, North End, McDonough, Mount Airy, and the East Side. So I know that if we can start uh, putting together job, a job training center that's going to prepare our, uh, our, our community citizens for the jobs of the future, um, then I believe that that's how we're going to make our community a lot better. Thank you, and I wanted to add a follow-up question, and this time we'll start with Jamie, which is what are the um, opportunities that you see in city council that most excite you to be elected to the job? Um, to be able to bring um, to our ward um, better outcomes as far as our um, economics goes. Um, right now, we have no workforce center. We have no... Um, temporary agencies um, for people for work, and that's a struggle for a lot of people that um, live within my neighborhood. Right now, it takes two buses and some walking in order to be able to get to a workforce center. Um, so I would like to see that in our um, neighborhood, and I would also like to be able to have people feel more cohesive as far as um, our neighborhoods go. Our ward is very big and it is very disenfranchised. We do have um, our roads and our lakes and that sort of thing that um, kind of divide us and I want to be able to bring us all back together again. And Bob? Uh, you know, I, 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 I agree also. I mean, we, we definitely got to have the Workforce Center um, where I said it needs to be. There's a highway heavy department building down there. We know that Governor Waltz wanted to, wanted to go ahead and put a 20 cent tax on the gas because he wanted to build the roads. 
um, rebuild the roads. Um, we know that clim the climate crisis is only going to get worse. So we know that with extreme heat, extreme cold, our roads are going to buckle and they're going to have to be repaired. So why can't we put the people and the citizens that are in that area to work? And that's what we need to do. So how about good paying union jobs? How about good paying government jobs? And how about the jobs of the future for the community citizens of, of, the, of Ward 5, right there in the middle? Um, that's what we have to do. The other part we have to do is we have to go ahead, we have to create community gardens. We have to create community gardens where we grow community, we grow, we grow food, we also grow, we also grow our city. And I think one of the best ways is that uh, by us taking the green spaces that are currently empty right now in our ward and we start putting, we start bringing communities together to grow that food, to make that food together, um, that this is the way that we are gonna grow community and also grow relationships in our community. And so this is how you fight, um, this is how you fight poverty, this is how you fight, uh, this is how you fight uh, crime, um, this is how you fight uh, just the, the, the ailments that are, that are directly affecting our community. The, this has worked in other cities. I know it can work in the city of St. Paul, especially in Ward 5. So I think we're definitely in need of some strong, strong leadership. And I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it in our ward. And I think a lot of that takes a lot of innovation, a lot of thinking outside of the box, and a lot of choices. And on that piece, we also need to be able to listen to our constituents. And that's something that I'll be bringing into city council, is the ability to be able to listen and to understand and to sit down with our community. So thank you. Um, the next question is, what is it in your background that you believe uniquely qualifies you to be in city council? What is it that makes you different from all of the other candidates in the race that you believe will bring something fresh to city council? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, put, I help put together a, a workforce training program with the Department of Corrections uh, where we're training inmates on how to do solar installations. And um, in that program, the, basically the idea behind it is to battle mass incarceration with, uh, with climate change, battle climate change with mass incarceration. Now, I just uh, got done uh, helping the, the state of New York implement the same program, and now they're doing it. There has been seven other, seven other states that have, that have followed this lead, um, and actually I got this idea from the state of California. So my point being is that, you know, when I talk about uh, putting together a workforce center, when I talk about... Uh, putting people to work and start preparing for the jobs of the future, um, I'm doing it. I'm a small business owner. Um, I, on a day-to-day -day business, I'm watching um, what's coming down the line and what's happening. Um, and I'm telling you that we need to start preparing uh, for the climate crisis and, and, and for renewable energy jobs. This is uh, when we found, when we, when the, when the, when the, the gas plant out in Excel did not get turned, did, did not get approved, um, you know what that means, people? That means a lot of renewable energy jobs. That's what that means. And we don't have the workforce to take care of that. Um, and I would, just, I would just be ecstatic if we could put that workforce center right down in the middle where everybody used to go shop, where everybody used to go and work also. That's, that's what we need to do. Um, the other part of this, too, is that we're going to have, we're, we're going we're to do the Reconnect Rondo project. This is a big project that's going to be happening here in St. Paul. Um, let's put the let's put our communities to work. Let's have our communities getting those contracts. Let's having the citizens of St. Paul doing that work. That is good paying jobs. That 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 is that is how we fight crime. That is how we build community, and that's how we bring people together. Um, I believe that um, for me, um, I have been a single parent, um, and I grew up in poverty, and I have also lived in poverty. Um, with my kids. Um, the three areas that I've worked in the most um, as uh, an adult is healthcare, human services, and education. And I learned a lot from those, all three of those positions, um, that all of us have the same needs, that all of us have the same wants, that all of us need um, basic, ha or have basic needs that, that we need to take care of. Um, I'm someone that's very bold. Um, I don't have a problem saying what it is that I need to say. 
And um, I'm someone who's been able to bring a lot of people together and work together. Right now, I don't see that happening in St. Paul. I see a lot of things being very one-sided. And you have to be able to find common ground and be able to work together from there. Um, I am somebody who has always been very transparent about who I am, um, how I work, what kind of things that I, um, that I believe in. And so I believe that that's something also that has been missing and that we really need to have come forward, is that we need to have transparency and we need to have partnerships with the people that live in our neighborhoods. And that means to be able to have full meetings together um, be able to sit down and listen and not just hear people and be able to take that into account the things that other people have to say in your ward. There is no one at all that ever um, has, has the answers to everything. But the thing that you have to really realize, too, is that your perspective is not the only perspective. And that's where we need to be able to bring people together to be able to talk about the issues that we're facing, be able to work on um, many of the different projects that we need to within our community, be open and transparent. So I have literally dedicated my whole working career life to working on housing, transportation. I've served on the Met Council's transportation board after doing an interview with 15 other people and ended up getting in and unseating somebody who had been in the position for over 20 years. I've served as an executive director in the same space that you guys are sitting in, in St. Anthony Park. In that four years, I was able to build in a food access program. I was able to do ADA compliancy and build a whole equity lens that was unseen of or unheard of in many of our other districts at that time. And able to be a trailblazer in those spaces and able to build in the kind of leadership and the kind of community that we so needed and bridging the north ends from the south ends and getting and making sure there was a collaboration to understand that it's not just about us, but it's about everybody in these communities. So, and on that, I've also been on, I also serve right now um, as an appointment with the governor uh, for Minsher, and I serve on that as well. A lot of the pieces that I do in Minsher is really talking about health literacy and making sure that it's for everybody to be able to understand and know. Um, we've also been able to build out a lot of our translation too of Somali and uh, Spanish speaking and all sorts of translations that we've been able to put together in there. And that was because of my leadership and making sure that we were not going to unsee people that have been um, having issues to be able to access health care. And there hasn't been one day, even in that position, that I haven't gone to bed every night remembering that there's still 400 and some thousand people without insurance every single day and to making sure what the efforts of our organization is doing to make sure that we're continuously trying to close those gaps. So in thinking about what I've brought in, a lot of that has been also, you know, and some of the pieces that even Jamie said, has because of my background too. Um, I was also a kid that had to struggle through homelessness and had to struggle with displacement and having to go place to place and be you know, within different school systems and a lot of displacement. Um, and trying really hard within my adulthood to make sure that I work on all types of housing issues and transportation issues and making sure that our voices are being counted and heard in those spaces too. Thank you. Uh, Jamie just brought up the transparency issue, which I know is one of the main values for St. Paul Strong. So I'm wondering how you would define transparency and how you would ensure that there is transparency uh, should you be elected. And should so, we, yeah, go ahead, thank you. So um, for me, transparency means to um, be honest and very forthcoming um, with information. Um, and I believe uh, what we have to do is we have to find ways to communicate with everyone. Right now, a lot of things that go on um, as far as city council um, communication doesn't reach everyone. Not everybody has a computer. Not everybody um, has the means to be able to um, access the information. So what we need to do is we need to find ways 
and I think that there are many different ways that we can reach communities and make sure that they know what is happening within our ward, what kind of things it is that we are working on, and being sure that they know that they have access um, to you as a candidate. And, and if I might just follow up with you, Jamie, what are some of the specific ways that you would ensure that you are accountable and listening to the community? Um, so I believe that one of the things is that I had asked for here not too long ago um, was that we have a all community meeting. Um, right now we've had a lot of um, gun violence and crime issues that have been happening within our wards and particularly in the north and um, that has not happened. And in order for our communities to be able to um, truly trust you and know that you have their best interest in mind, you have to be able to make them spaces available. Not everybody wants to talk about those things in big spaces, so you need to be able to um, find ways, other ways, whether that's meeting with someone individually or meeting with small groups of people. But also I would like to see um, some type of communication piece that goes out um, to all households within um, not just the ward, but within, um, within the city that says here are some of the things that we're looking at this year and being able to um, have people reach you um, easily. Okay. Oh. So I, as being the executive director at one time and for a community council, we've had a lot of contentious situations as you can imagine. And then that space, it's important for us to be able to not just host meetings and not under the philosophy that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. We have the ability to bring the tables to community and we have the ability for us to be able to reach out. Doing survey and analysis and making sure that we're asking the right questions and devising the right questions is really important for our communities. And it's not about just listening to the loudest person in the room today, but it's really about us kind of reaching out and spreading our wins to ask asking the right questions. And that's something that I've been able to do and bring to my job and into this position as well too. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. every Wednesday at Rice Street Library. Come and talk to me. That's where I want to be at. That's where you can go and talk to me. You got an issue. You, need, you want to see something done. Well, come talk to me. Come just tell me what's going on. Let, let me know how I can help you as your city councilman. That's what I want to do. That's where I'll be. Um, also, go ahead. I mean, let, 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 let's start a le let's serve an email serve. Let's get the communication out, just like everybody else here said. Um, that that's the way that we communicate with the uh, with the uh, with the community. But every six to eight p.m., I say up Wednesday at at the Rice Street Library. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one of the most contentious issues um, in this year's election cycle is, of course, about the trash referendum. And I am wondering how each of you are planning to vote on the trash referendum and why or why not you support the, the current trash policy. And uh, who haven't we started with in a while? Maybe with Bob? Oh, okay. uh, yes, um, I, I believe that the whole trash referendum should have been, um, it should never have gotten to this point. It should never have gotten to the state for the state to decide to put this on the ballot. This is, this is uh, ridiculous. The, the, the city council and the, and the mayor um, should have uh, been able to go ahead and, um, and solve this problem and nip it in the bud. Um, but I also feel like there could have been other ways that we could have helped these trash, the trash haulers themselves. We could have retrofitted their, their, uh, their, their trucks, um, whatever the situation was and whatever um, uh, uh, the, the, the city had explained that why they were doing what they were doing. Um, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to say um, that I'm actually going to side with the, with, the, with the citizens on this, and, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say uh, uh, no. So I am voting no on the trash, refer or on the trash referendum also. Um, this started some time ago before the city decided um, for sure that they were going to go through with this plan. I had went down to city council and I had expressed my concerns about us having um, this system. And I have the same concerns now that I did then. Um, people are not able to share 
um, zero wasters are not able, um, are having to pay for trash cans also when there is absolutely no need for that. Um, <clears throat> we have a large population of people um, who, are, who live in poverty. And this is another extra, um, an extra thing for them to take care of. For me, myself, my trash went up two times as much as it was before. This last winter, I had five different times that my trash hadn't been picked up. I had been on the phone several different times trying to find out who it was that I needed to talk to about it. I got um, quite the runaround um, in who it was that I was supposed to speak with. And I just have been frustrated and very upset. Um, the city charter um, is our constitution. And there was over 6,000 of us that had signed a petition um, to have the trash put on the referendum. And the city council said no. And that's where we got into this trash lawsuit. And so the trash lawsuit went to one judge. That judge said it needed to be put on the referendum. And the city spent more of our money, more of our money, not their money, more of our money, fighting the people that were asking for this to be put on the referendum. It went to the Supreme Court, as we all know, and now we have the opportunity to um, be able to vote on it. Right now I feel like there's some <laughs> scare tactics stuff that's happening um, when they're talking about um, raising our property taxes, and um, I think that people really need to take a look at um, what this means. There is a force majeure which gives the city an out as far as this goes. So right now, um, besides the fact that I had planned on, on saying no before, I feel even stronger about that because of the fact that I feel that we are not um, being told the truth about the whole situation. Um, the other thing is that um, I'm somebody who really supports small businesses, and there were several different um, trash companies when this first started. Um, the reason that some of these trash companies, these smaller trash companies got into this, not wasn't because they wanted to get into this, but if they wanted to do business in St. Paul, they had to join the consortium. Since that time, um, we, as we've seen, there have been several buyouts, and now we are in a spot where it's, it's a monopoly. It's a monopoly. And um, if we're going to be supporting small businesses, then that's exactly what we need to do is encourage people as far as small businesses go and be able to um, support them in that way. So first of all, I believe in the idea of organized trash. You know, and I'm going to say that right out loud. I just feel like the current policy isn't right for our constituency and it's not right for our community. And there's 6,500 names that say so too. And I think like as the person that's looking into that, it is hard for me to be able to turn my back and not say that none of those names matter and that we're not going to look into that situation. And I think that for me, um, why we haven't been able to kind of get in front of it it's beyond me. Why can't we have a conversation like civilized people and just talk it out and talk about through policy and to be able to amend this and to create an opt out piece and to amend that current policy is beyond me. Why can't that be done? And I feel like sparing us from all these extra lawn signs that we have in our home for us to just to be able to have a conversation. And this is absolutely ridiculous. And 6,500 people can't be wrong. It can. And I know there's going to be some outliers of people that don't really care for the current systems. But we're also talking about people that are in fixed income. We're also talking about seniors. We're also talking about groups and communities that can't spare an extra $20 or they will be displaced from their housing. And we know current policies have the ability to increase rental rates, too. We need to be able to think about our constituency as a whole, not just for a piece. And what things that might not affect me personally at my house doesn't mean that doesn't have the ability to affect others. And that's what city policy should be about. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, 
As everyone knows, climate change is becoming more and more of an issue, and especially at the local level. St. Paul has come up with a climate action and resiliency plan, and I'm just wondering what all of you think about it, and do you agree with it, and how do you think that it might be amended or, or improved um, in terms of what's there already? Yeah, I mean, I I want to I want to put more uh, renewable energy up. Um, we all know that the second biggest strain on um, on school on schools specifically uh, is is uh, their en the energy bill. And um, I mean, if we could put solar on top of our St. Paul public schools, um, you know, we can knock that out. Um, and with that, with those extra dollars, we can we can afford teacher salaries. We can also go ahead and we can go ahead and do after school programs. So that's the first thing we got to do. Um, the second thing is that we all know we're going to have a pension crisis. We all know that people are living longer. We've got better health care. Well, you know what, people? That means St. Paul's going to have a pension problem, okay? So what we need to do is we need to start putting retrofitting and doing energy efficiency projects that are going to be able to help our city and our, our city buildings so that our city can go ahead and save money right away and take those, and take those extra funds and put them back into uh, what our general budget and whatever it is that we may need. Um, so those, so the, uh, those right off the, those are right off the first things that we need to do. We also need to go ahead and, and, and we also need to take very seriously the fact that, you know, we're going to have more serious uh, down, 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 downpours from 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 weather, and our infrastructure right now cannot handle. Uh, the amount of water pressure that's going to be going through our pipes. So we really have to start thinking about how we're going to help and build, rebuild our infrastructure. Um, also, we need to talk about housing density. We need to talk about uh, transit. Um, these are all things that we have to address. And right now, currently, I don't really, uh, really see that uh, our, our, our plan um, uh, address. Uh, it, it's a good plan, but I don't think it addresses it to that extent. And um, uh, those would be my first things right off the bat because we can also go ahead and, and put people to work and get jobs, really good paying jobs off of that too. So I'm, I'm someone who really truly believes in um, renewable energy, but I also believe in that we can use a lot of the things that we already have. Right now over in um, the North End where I live at right now, there are several buildings that have been empty for a long period of time. Um, we continue to hear about more building and new things and um, new buildings and those sort of things and I think that we need to be able to um, use some of what we have. One of the things that I had thought about before when um, we were, when a bunch of us were talking about transportation is um, being able to say, hey, it'd be great if there were um, companies that would say, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and let our people um, telecommute um, certain number of hours or a certain number of days every week. That would that would help a lot with um, our cars on the road. Right now, one of the things that I'm concerned about, as far as um, environmental in the immediate area, is that um, there is a project that's going on on Larpenter. Um, right now and another one that they're talking about on Rice Street and these projects are ones that um, right now there's a pilot project on the one um, on Larpenter and what's happened is there are several vehicles that are backed up. So I got to wonder this entire time while they're sitting there how much of these emissions are sitting in these small areas in these small spots. So sometimes plans will look good as far as, um, you know, we talk about um, looking at different modes of transportation. And one of the things um, in that project was more bike lanes. And the talk was um, this would be something that was environmentally friendly. Um, but when we're talking about cars being backed up for long periods of time and emissions, um, spilling out in the air within those areas where there's children playing and there's um, apartment buildings there. Um, I think we need to um, be taking a closer look at what these plans are. Do they really make sense? And are we just trading one thing for another thing? 
So I always feel like we can always do better when it comes to climate change because the idea of the word change is like it's an option and we no longer have options to us anymore. Um, and I think one of those biggest deals that I'm looking at is even promoting and increasing the idea of recycling too. I'd like to see that as a more of initiative on our taxes too. That would be great that we actually got some money back from that. And I know that's a few other cities have actually promoted that too. Um, that second space as to making sure it's been interesting to even see some of our own um, transit like shelters that don't have any recycling attached to it and there's no garbage cans and yet there's a poster that talks about recycling. And I said, there's a real irony about this, right? I was like, there's this huge poster about recycling and, and I was like, there's no recycling bin anywhere near it. How does that make sense? And we wanna make sure that we're making sense out of the things that we're not just saying, but we wanna be able to put them in actionable items. And really promoting that, even with our small businesses, to really encouraging them why recycling is important. And asking the questions, and to making sure how can we create a community that is not just about throwing everything away, but has reusable spaces. The other secondary piece is about development. We have a lot of development that's going around in these cities. Why aren't they green? Why aren't they using some of the lead um, information that we have right now, right, environmental, creating a green roof? What does that look like? Using recycled materials, you know? There's a lot that we could be doing, but we can't do it by not asking the right questions, and we can't just turn our backs and say, well, hopefully someday they'll, you know, they'll get around to it. It's about really the city requiring our developers to do build better projects that are more environmentally sound. That other third piece for me is really making sure, even with small businesses, that we're buying locally and not using our vehicles. A part of what Jamie was talking about was also about um, the road diets that we've been experiencing in our ward. And unfortunately for me, I, I do look at that as a place to be able to do some traffic calming because it's so needed, especially in, our, especially in our ward. We've had a lot of accidents and a lot of incidents that were unnecessarily due to the fact that a lot, we did not have sidewalks. We did not have some of the basic things that we needed in our ward. And lighting is still a huge issue, which also creates a lot of safety concerns too. Walkability is extremely important and also builds into our, our health as well, our equitable health pieces. And in thinking about that, how do we create a space that's also accessible for everyone to be able to access through our city? So these are some of the things that kind of come to mind, you know, buying locally, making sure that we're using our legs and our other modes of transportation that are not our vehicles to be able to get around and having local places for us to be able to work at would be great. Thank you. We've only got about a minute left, and so what I'm hoping in, in lieu of um, having closing statements, I'm hoping that each of you can take, um, can repeat your names, and also just take three words to say what are the th three main priorities or the three main qualities that you would like to bring to this job. Uh, Bob Blake, uh, let's see, Workforce Center, and uh, community gardens, uh, like I said, those are like air conditioners for the city. And, um, uh, you know, I, I would just say public safety, too. Um, I think we need to start taking care of our first responders. Because um, as we take care of them, they're going to take care of us better, too. Thank you. Um, Jamie Hendricks. Um, public safety is number one on my list. Um, fiscal responsibility is another one. And... Um, equitable education in our, um, in our schools. So for me, housing is a huge issue. Affordable access to housing is something that's critical and needs to be dealt with. We can't continue to have people that don't have a place that they even call home at this point. Um, secondary for me is the economical sustainability of our communities. Making sure that we're creating communities that have access to reasonable wages for people to be able to live their good quality of life as well. And in that public you know, space of what are we gonna do around safety, it's all interconnected at the end of the day. How do we figure out these pieces? We need to be able to stabilize our communities. We live in one of the most impoverished communities that's in our city of St. Paul, and we need to be able to have resources and be proactive about how we work with our community. Thank you very much, candidates. These have all been Ward 5. Thank you.
And we'll be back in five minutes with Ward 6. Welcome back to the St. Paul Strong Forum. Uh, right now, we have all of the candidates uh, who could make it from Ward 6. And so first, I'm going to start, as I did before, asking everyone to just introduce themselves uh, with their name. And let's start uh, at the opposite end. Well, hi. Good evening, good evening, everybody. And Yajong, my name is Terry Tao. Good evening. Greg Copeland. Good evening. Kasim Basuri. Hi, everyone. My name is Nelsie Yang. My gender pronouns are she and her. Alexander Bourne, hola como estas, Najon, uh, trying to think of what other languages I know, uh, Guten Tag, um, yeah. Awesome, thank he, you. He, him, his, excuse me. All right. So my first question is going to be, what is your vision for your ward and for the city, and what are your top priorities if you were elected? And again, we'll start at the end. Well, um, again, my vision for St. Paul as someone who grew up in the city is that St. Paul is a great city where everybody thrives and everybody is prospering, and that's because we decided to make the investments to make this happen. Hi, Terry. So, I'm, just, sorry. I'm just being told that everyone needs to speak into oh. their mic, so okay. get really sorry. close. Okay, okay. Um, uh, so again, um, my vision for the city of St. Paul um, is that it, it, it's a city where it thrives and grows because, uh, and everyone thrives because we've made the investments to make this possible. For me, my th top three issues are working on increasing economic development, maintaining and preserving housing affordability, and creating great safe neighborhoods. Well, I, I think the city, uh, frankly, is off track. I think we are so far off the track that uh, we've got to do some work to get back. Public safety's got to get back to being number one. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, you could sell the idea of cutting the police force on the east side of the city, uh, I live in grid 54, it's one of the busiest ones, is, uh, is ludicrous. Now, the other thing we need to do as a, as a city is to vote no on this trash thing. Uh, we should not need to go to the state supreme court to find out how to read our city charter. Obviously, we've got a city council that is dysfunctional. We have a mayor that can't read it either. You don't need the city attorney to sit there and read it and then read it wrong and force us into this disaster. This is an embarrassment. I was 12 years on the Charter Commission. And there is, you know, it's written in the 1970s. It wasn't written in some Latin or Greek. It's in plain English. And frankly, you know, when we have that kind of a problem, we've got basic uh, issues. The other, the other thing we have to do is prioritize our spending. We've got roads that are falling apart. 80% of the people in the city have a car. I propose we double the amount of CIB parks uh, money going into our roads uh, from last year. That's, that, would, that would mean only spending actually $36 million. You know, and take a little vacation on the idea of spending $15 million, which is in, which is in the, uh, the budget as it stands at this point, for bike trails. You know, we need to get the roads fixed. The money is there to get it started. It's not gonna finish the job, but we need to have priorities and get going here. Uh, the city is not the most livable city in America in the state that we're in right now. And we all know that, and that's why there's so many of us running for the city council. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, for, uh, thank you St. Paul Strong and SBNN for hosting this event, for having me. My name is Kasim Basuri, which is easy to remember by uh, it, it's easy to remember because it rhymes with Missouri. I was born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and, and immigrated to the United States with my parents and siblings as a young child. I lived in a refugee camp and public housing. I understand the struggles of marginalized communities as we work to build a good life for ourselves and our families. I'm a strong believer in community service and volunteered my time building relationships between police officers and at-risk youth. I'm a small business owner, a mentor, a husband, a father, of two children with another due at any moment. So if I leave in a rush, you'll know why. <clears throat> I'm running for city council because the Eastsiders need to be equally represented and have their voices, ideas, um, and opini opinions heard loudly and clearly downtown. 
I, I believe leadership begins with listening, and there, there hasn't been enough listening downtown for too long. <coughs> My top three priorities are public safety. Little else does matter if you don't feel safe in your own home, your school, or your neighborhood. Job, attracting and retraining businesses to invest in good paying jobs in St. Paul for the residents of Ward 6 and the East Side. Housing, we need more high quality housing, choices for all of our East Siders. More affordable housing, more senior housing, and more housing for larger families. I'm here this evening, not only so you can get to know me and learn about my vision for St. Paul, but also for me to hear your ideas, your concerns for making Ward 6 a better place to live and raise a family. Everyone is busy, and I appreciate your taking the time to join us this evening and those viewing this program. I believe in representative government that requires your participation too. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Nelsie Yang. Uh, first off, I just want to say it's so humbling to be able to be here. Thank you to the hosts of the forum. Thank you to community leaders who are here and, and neighbors who continue to be building blocks of our city. Um, you know, I want to share that I'm a daughter of refugees. I'm also a renter in the east side, and uh, I'm a union steward and racial equity organizer at Take Action Minnesota. Um, the work that I do there, which is work that I really love, a lot of it is around criminal justice reform, and ultimately the work that I do, um, even, even outside of Take Action Minnesota, is really to dismantle the deep injustices in the systems that we live in. And those injustices I talk about are the deep racism, the deep sexism and corporate greed that, that you know, exists in our community all around, whether or not we see it. Um, I'm running for a city council to be a progressive voice for this side of the city, uh, a community that I, I deeply love, a community that my extended family and family members have settled in you know, after, moving, after uh, taking refuge here in the U.S. And what really frustrates me is that year after year, I continue to see the people around me continue to struggle. Um, and I wonder how many of you actually have had a similar upbringing to me, where, you know, actually I came from a family that wasn't poli politically involved, where my parents didn't know how to navigate the school system or even, like, their local community as well. So everywhere I saw all around me, uh, whether it was going to schools that were, that were not fully funded or seeing, you know, going on, uh, driving on roads that had potholes um, and communities that felt like there wasn't really deep civic engagement, all of that was actually very normal to me until I finally started to, to do a lot of work in my community and realized that this whole whole story around poverty, this whole story around racism and sexism that existed in our community, it's actually something that lives all throughout. And we need people who are actually here fighting and organizing and people who are representing us fighting to the core to make sure that we actually undo the injustices and make sure that every single person in the east side, every single family, every single uh, child, no matter what zip code you live in, that you actually get a fair chance to be able to do well. That's all. That's what all my work is all about, you know, in the east side of St. Paul. And, you know, I... I've just been so humbled about, along my campaign trail. I, but I was the first candidate to announce last year in July. It's been a year, over a year that I've been running my campaign. And to see the, the amount of people who are joining the campaign, joining the movement, who you know, are, are coming around on this, very, this vision that like, galvanizes them is something, is like the most humbling thing to be able to see in a community that has been so marginalized. And because of that people power, I really believe it's what you know, allowed me as a candidate, as someone who you know, is here like a working class person and living paycheck to paycheck to be able to lead in first place in all the ballots at the DFL convention. And we've raised, we're a grassroots campaign, raised over $85,000 for our council race to put back into the people in the community. And, you know, that's like what my entire campaign is all about. I'm so excited to be able to share more with you about the work that we're doing um, and the work that we want to, to get started in city council as well. Awesome. As you all... Per stated, my name is Alexander Bourne. Uh, I, too, am a candidate for St. Paul City Council, uh, Ward 6, which covers much of East St. Paul. Uh, Ward 6 is the community that I uh, grew up in. My mother first moved my sister and I to uh, St. Paul in 1995. I was just the age of five. Um, shortly after, uh, my uh, time here in St. Paul is like many others. I 
uh, grew up marginalized in the space of opportunity, particularly in the space of education. Um, at the age of six, I was formally diagnosed with different forms of mental illnesses, um, uh, uh, placed in special ed programming, uh, where the groundwork was laid uh, to later deprive me of equal opportunity. Uh, like many other uh, black and brown kids here in the city of St. Paul, uh, particularly Ramsey County, um, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was, it, was, it was hard. It was really hard. Um, uh, as a result, it led to different forms of dif uh, displacement. Uh, I, like many other individuals in the city, uh, ended up in multiple uh, juvenile detention centers throughout the state of Minnesota, and in some instances, more than once. Um, as you all know, Boys Totem Town closed uh, about two months ago. Um, I was fortunate enough to speak at that uh, closing ceremony simply because many individuals that worked there uh, at the time of closing uh, worked with me as well uh, when I was a young teenager. Um, in 2006, uh, excuse me, 2007, uh, my mother was blessed um, uh, to purchase a home in Hastings, Minnesota. Um, that's where I spent the last uh, year of high school uh, in Minnesota and ultimately went on to graduate. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. It's a little long, if y'all don't mind, just a couple extra minutes, because I, I really want you all to understand my perspective. We don't really have these platforms to uh, share these kinds of narratives. Um, in 2008, I was blessed with uh, multiple scholarships to uh, attend Xavier University of Louisiana uh, with excuse me, under the pretense that I was gonna go on and uh, become an orthodontist. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that journey fell short um, in 2011 when I was wrongfully accused of sexual assault. Um, I know that you all read a lot of uh, media outlets where uh, they attempt to dehumanize and criminalize me for different uh, things in my life, uh, but in all reality, they're really just highlighting uh, a lot of the challenges that I've had to overcome uh, successfully, may I add. Um, in 2011, I started my first business with just $156, uh, not because that's all it took, but simply because that's all I had. I didn't have uh, any social resources to leverage. I didn't have any financial resources to leverage. I just had the will and determination. So when people say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, um, well, I didn't have any bootstraps. I didn't have a shoe to tie it to, excuse me, uh, sew that leather, leather to. I didn't have uh, any uh, uh, needle, no thread, nothing, right? Just the will and determination. Uh, that business went on to do really well, really quickly. Uh, in 2014, um, I had a very wealthy client uh, who had a husband uh, that is still a prominent trial attorney in the city of New Orleans. Uh, what we now know is that because that wife did not get her shoes back on time, uh, that uh, her husband uh, paid the district attorney $5,000 to have me prosecuted and $1,000 to have the judge uh, hold me incarcerated for nine months without bond. Um, if you all may recall, when I first announced my candidacy, uh, the uh, Pioneer Press, they wrote an uh, article in the heading read, uh, after nine months in notorious Louisiana jail, uh, he seeks to become uh, your next city council member. Uh, the problem with that article uh, is that 44.7% uh, of the raw content that was used in that article was blatantly false. Um, it's really unfortunate. Uh, but it's my harsh reality, just yet another challenge that I had to overcome. Um, that being said, uh, fast forward, uh, excuse me, I have to tell you all this. Uh, so after four years, over 250 plus court appearances, 11 trial attorneys, $100,000 in legal related fees, we won. That's a success. And I want you all to know that I'm gonna fight for you all here in the city of St. Paul just as hard as I fought uh, to maintain my very own civil liberties. Um, in 2018, in the fall, um, I hit a pothole. It was a pothole that was really large, a pothole uh, that many people already knew uh, was in our community. Um, I hit that pothole. I called down the city, uh, city hall uh, to complain about it. Um, Quite frankly, I didn't like the response that I received. And instead of complaining, I decided to activate uh, myself and a couple uh, friends. Uh, we went out over the weekend. Uh, we hit about 300 doors, had about 200 really great conversations. Um, Alex, 
Alexander? I know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask seconds. you to. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up you. because I feel like I need to go back Absolutely. and ask Absolutely. and allow all of the other candidates Absolutely. to talk about what Absolutely. makes them unique Absolutely. and what they can bring. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we hit that pothole, and we went out door knocking. We built a consensus, and we turned it into a platform. And that platform today, I think you're. Uh, the latter part of your question was our priorities. My priorities are public safety uh, and accountability. Uh, we would like them. Uh, and can you just list them rather than go sure, into all of sure. them? Sure, okay. sure. Um, equity in our housing and developmental spaces. Uh, we want to uh, continue to build coalitions around environmental related issues. Uh, but most importantly, we want to bring community together. There's a lot of people working in siloids right now. And one of my biggest attributes is strategic partnerships. I believe that I can bring that perspective to the city council that is missing uh, in the name of transparency and inclusion and so forth. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I want to go back to all of the other candidates because my next question was really about asking what is it that you bring to the, you potentially bring to the job that's truly unique? A perspective, an experience, a background. Nelsie went into it a little bit in terms of her background, but I wanted to make sure that um, that some of the f some of the other folks had some time to go into it in a little bit more detail. And this time, we'll start with uh, Greg Copeland. Thank you. I guess if I had to, to point out a couple of things, uh, you know, I've been a fortunate fellow uh, when my wife and I moved to uh, Minnesota. Uh, in 1992, we were uh, uh, able to get her the health care that she needed over at the Courage Center, uh, over at the uh, Abbott Northwestern uh, Center as well with Sister Kenny. And uh, so, you know, I'm not going to go into all of that, but that, that was a, a big uh, change in our life when she was uh, rear-ended in an automobile accident that uh, um, caused her to have a, a brain injury and me to become a caregiver. Uh, beyond that, uh, I had the opportunity to serve as the uh, district council president in uh, Payne Phelan. I also served uh, six years uh, on the uh, capital improvement budget uh, board under uh, uh, Mayor Coleman, as in uh, Norm Coleman, our, our uh, last uh, very good mayor, I think, who understood how to bring some money over to the east side. I'll say that with all of you present from all your different perspectives. But the east side for 30 years had been on a starvation diet. When we got there, there were three bridges, the uh, Arcade Bridge, uh, the um, Forest uh, Bridge as well. I, I didn't even include that in the original. And, and certainly the Earl Street Bridge. We're all in tough shape. And the railroad had done their best to knock down the Edgerton Street Bridge. Well, by the time uh, Norm was done, uh, pretty much the dollars were there, and those bridges uh, were fixed. Uh, we, we weren't able to keep the Burr Street Bridge. We lost that one. Uh, but the, uh, you know, that's what the city council decided at the time. Uh, so, you know, we've had a, we've had a fortunate uh, uh, experience for six years. So I knew where, knew where to go to find the money to get things done. And I still know how to do that. And then 12 years on the uh, city charter commissions give me the respect for the charter. We're unique in Minnesota uh, being a charter city. And frankly, uh, what we've gone through with this trash thing, uh, you know, it's one thing to go and vote no on the trash, and I'm, as I told you, I'm going to do that. And without any reservation, I signed the uh, petition. I was one of the signers of that in 2018. Uh, but the worst outcome of this is the embarrassment, uh, I think, to our city uh, that, uh, you know, so unnecessary for the city council and the mayor uh, dragging us up to the state Supreme Court so that they could read what the city charter had to say and tell us what we already knew as citizens who said, you know, this uh, charter allows us to have a referendum. If a city council is going to stand in the way of citizens with a petition like that, what won't they do? Well, we know what they won't do. They won't fix the roads. You know, they haven't done a good job with that. And, and frankly, that's, again, a priority. Uh, you know, I think, I think we ought to be spending uh, more money on that because we have a crisis. And frankly, uh, that's something that I did when I was city manager in uh, Maplewood. We doubled the amount of residential street paving in the two years that I was there. We also cut the property tax the second year. We froze it the first year. You know, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do in St. Paul. 
Uh, we need to spend uh, less money on uh, the things that we do here. We've got to, we've got to get into the uh, century. One of the uh, folks in the past uh, panel for Ward 5 talked about a pension crisis. Do you think we're going to solve that pension crisis by pretending it doesn't exist? Do you think we're going to solve our other financial problems by pretending they don't exist? I'm going to tell you that is just fool's thinking, and it's not going to happen. Uh, when I asked the mayor at one of his budget sessions, you know, what is it that we can do to save money? Uh, well, he didn't have one, one item to offer up. I had a whole bunch of them. And frankly, you know, when you look at the uh, city, uh, we're, we're retiring a lot of people. He, I asked him, how many, how many people are retiring each year, Mayor? He told me about 200. Well, there's your opportunity to start trimming the budget and doing things differently. That's what business does. And, you know, we can all talk about how the corporations are this and that, but frankly, you've got to have the money to spend it. And I think people in this city where we have 35% of the people, at least over in my neck of the woods, are poor. And it doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter whether they moved here yesterday or been here all their life. They're still poor. Are we going to do anything about that, or are we going to just keep talking about it? Uh, thank you, Mr. Copeland. Um, and uh, let's go to uh, Terry Tao, please. And you were you were the briefest. So yes. Thank you. <laughs> to start I, yeah. with, um, well, thank you. I think the question the, is about what makes me. The e the question is what makes you unique in terms of your background and experience, and how will that affect you if you are elected into city yeah. council? Well, first, I want to say something. I grew up here in St. Paul, right? I grew up in the Frogtown neighborhood. And so um, during a time when it was not very safe, we didn't play outside very much as kids. But at the same time, I learned that the way I was going to affect change was to actually do the work in my community. So as a young person, I learned um, skills around building relationships, skills around um, how um, you know to go out and door knock and talk to our neighbors. And for me, I've really carried that message my whole career. So for the the past 15 years, I spent it doing, uh, working in the field of community economic development. I've worked on issues of foreclosure. I remember going to help families call the bank, their banks to try to save their homes, many of them on the east side from being foreclosed upon, especially Hmong families because they needed interpreters. I have worked on issues of small businesses. I come from a small business family. We used to have a building along University and Western, right? So I know the sacrifice. I grew up working in the small businesses, so I knew the sacrifice that people are making to um, create livelihoods and generational wealth for their families. And I've also worked on issues around um, making sure, uh, around lo local workforce issues too, looking at some of the opportunities where we can grow careers for people because these are folks in our communities. What's unique is that I understand that we have a lot of young people and that our greatest potential on the east side is to make those investments in folks. So when I said earlier about my vision about investments, it's because we have to. We cannot import our way out of this problem from the labor shortage. We have to be working on growing what we have, the folks we have here. I also think um, that's just from the lived experience side. From the technical side, I actually have had nine years of experience on the St. Paul Planning Commission. Most recently, I chaired the Neighborhood and Comprehensive Planning Committee that shepherded through the 2040 Comprehensive Plan with great goals around increasing density for our, our city, um, goals around um, you know hoping to get some of the climate change goals involved in there, but really saying, what's the type of land use? What do we want to see in our city for the next? 20 plus years, and I was really honored to be part of that initiative. I currently serve on the Board of Minnesota Housing. Governor Mark Dayton appointed me about two years ago as the only St. Paul representative, the first Hmong American representative, to look at how we're going to use our money to preserve affordable housing and build affordable housing across the state of Minnesota. And um, and in addition to that, I have had 15 years of doing relationships in the community. I sit on the boards of a lot of organizations because I roll up my sleeves and I do the work. We ask the hard questions. I've been on organizations we've had to lay off people, where we've had to deal with very tough issues in our community um, in response to community needs, where we've had to cut programs because we just didn't have the money for them. But along the way, it's about building relationships, um, which is really important to me. Ask folks on the ground. They know the work that I've done and that I'm not just someone who's got that, um, you know, not just bringing forth, uh, you know, th these ideas out of, out of nowhere. They're coming because they're informed and I'm connected with community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Basori. So um, what makes me unique in my, my work experience, right? So I've been uh, in volunteering um, since I was 14 in middle school 
we had this program in Mankato where we had to take action on an issue. And that was my start in volunteering and different things. So one of the things that I did with my younger brother was we volunteered at a nursing home close to our house where we went to the senior housing and, and listened to the seniors there. <clears throat> Moving on to my time in college, in 2010, I worked uh, with Cura Center for Urban Regional Affairs at the U of M while I was finishing up my bachelor's in political science on the US Census in 2010. That year was really important to make sure that everybody was counted. Um, and my project was to count the Somali community in the Cedar Riverside area. That year, with grassroots um, organizing, we were able to count 25,000 Somalis that lived in South Minneapolis by door knocking and going to families and telling them, you can write in how many people live in your two bedroom house. Even though there was, on, there was only two bedrooms in that house, there was at least five, seven people that were living there. Um, and they were afraid to write those information into their census uh, because they thought their landlords would see this information. Um, so we worked uh, tirelessly to make sure that the community and the needs of the community, with the US Census every 10 years being counted, the resources are depleted from cities because the, the people that are living there are not counted. Um, and we are facing the same thing now with the 2020 uh, census that is coming up where our president is uh, making uh, ways where it, he's telling people that he's gonna uh, put this uh, citizenship question on there and scaring people not to fill in their census, um, which would deplete the, the, the resources the community needs. Other things that I've done um, while I was working, um, at, while, I was, while I was attending school, one of the ways I was paying for my schooling was being a medical transport. And I would, uh, I would uh, take patients or uh, people who were chemically dependent from the east side um, to treatment centers in, in the sub west, west, west suburbs like Brooklyn Park um, and other areas where they would get treatment. Um, during that time um, is when I saw that St. Paul forgot the east side. It was back in 2010 and so that I noticed the east side was the part of the city that was forgotten. And there was, there was roads that were broken, potholes. Um, There's many issues in that area. So I made a promise to myself that I would come back one day and do something about this area and I would buy my first home there. Um, and I did do that. And about three years ago, I bought my first home in the east side and I am an agent, an agent, an, um, a change agent for, for the east side where I um, am I'm running for, for city, uh, city council right now. Um, I've worked as a youth ambassador, St. Paul Youth Ambassador, where we helped countless numbers of youth who were on the streets, getting them back on track, making sure that they got the right resources that they need. I've also um, I've worked on youth violence prevention as a consultant in Minneapolis, and also in the city of St. Paul with the community ambassador's work. So there's many programs that I've done. I've also sat on many boards and also volunteered for many organizations that work with youth and um, communities to help them um, find housing, find employment. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been really busy wearing many hats and working for the community and working for the people of St. Paul. Thank you. So I wanna name that even though I'm up here as a candidate running for office, I'm, so, I'm also a voter as well. Like in the past years, you know, I, I've been a very consistent voter and I also always put my vote towards somebody who I know has integrity to people. Someone who is actually very serious about, about running campaigns and making sure that we put, our, we, we put our cities, you know, our states, you know, toward a more progressive direction. And that means that we need p candidates, you know, who are actually serious in, in raising money and inviting people into a grassroots movement. We need, so we need uh, candidates who are here being connectors to different stakeholders, whether you're from a union, whether you're a teacher, a PCA worker, or you're a resident, you know, sitting on a district council meeting. And we also need candidates who are serious uh, about bringing people together. And like these are these are the things that you know are key to actually being able to win campaigns and be a, being able to create progress. And like you know, talking about that, some of the jo most joyful campaigns that I have worked on is uh, electing Governor Tim Walls. Um, also, uh, County Commissioner Tr Trista Mattis Castillo as well. I really love her values around making sure that we have community gardens uh, in uh, in our communities here. Uh, and also school board member Marnie Zhang. And when I think about uh, these candidates who I have supported, I supported them because they're people who, when it comes to very contentious issues, they know exactly where they stand and, uh, and where they, like who they support. 
There are people who are here fighting to make sure that we have pol fully, uh, fully funded school, uh, public schools. There are people who are here making sure that we have public dollars being invested directly into families, into people, into children, and into our community. And there are also people here who want power to remain in the hands of people, rather than big corporations who, you know, uh, who most of the time, or a lot of the times, come into our community and actually don't invest and, and return the things that we need them to. Um, and these are all things that I bring to the table with me. And you, know, you asked me about uh, the, the things that make me unique. It's that integrity to people and knowing where I stand um, on issues that are very contentious or you know, issues that are actually basic needs that we all need. Um, and I say that because the integrity to people is actually something that you cannot learn. It is something that is, is like crafted in you year after year because of your upbringing, because of your story. But experience, or like sitting on boards, you know, being on committees, these are all things that we all can actually do. And like the most important thing is that when we are, when we're in a community like the East Side of St. Paul, like I know for sure, we need somebody who's gonna fight and make sure we get our fair share. And I say that because when I look at other places in St. Paul, maybe places that you know typically have families who are more affluent, the communities there are like drastically different from what the East Side looks like. And if you know, if you want to see that, you know, come drive around the east side and then drive around other areas in St. Paul. And I would love to hear your thought about that. Um, and, and it takes somebody who, you know, knows that we have a piece of the pie. Well, we have a pie, right? And the pie gets divided. And, like, the most important thing is to have someone representing the community, someone who wants all voices at the table, no matter if you're a renter, a homeowner, you're, you're someone who's young, someone who's a senior on fixed income, someone who is actually here representing every single person. Like, that integrity is something I bring with me every single time. I've had to bring it with me because as a union steward, like, I fight for my, my union members all the time. And, like, when we bargain for contracts, I, didn't, I need to know exactly what is at stake for them and what we need to fight and what we need to win. And, like, this past year, we won a historical labor contract, 10% raises for every single person in our union. Uh, and, like, when I talk to people who, are, <laughs> who, are, have done, uh, who have bargained on contracts before, they're like, Nelsie, how did you and your team make that happen? And it's because we, we glued our feet to the ground and knew exactly what we wanted for, for, our, for our people, our members. And, like, that's exactly what I bring to the table with me as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to ask about trash, but because Mr. Copeland has actually addressed that in two of his answers already, um, I think I'm, we're going to skip Mr. Copeland on this one. Um, but I'd like to go back to Mr. Basori and ask about, with the coming trash referendum, are you going to be voting yes or no? Uh, what are your reasons for doing so? And if you, in what ways do you think that the contract um, should it be changed, uh, how it should be changed, if you think it should be changed. Can I respectfully interject? Oh. I, cut my mic I didn't answer the last question. Well, that was because, remember, I went and asked everybody, you went into your background. Mm. And remember, I said, when I go to <laughs> everyone else, I'm going to skip you because we had given you a lot of time to talk about um, your background and what, what was making you unique. But I promise at the end, everyone will be able to reiterate what makes them unique. Is, is that OK? All right. Um, so Kasim, would you like to talk about the trash, please? Yes. Thank you. I'll be voting no to give the voices back to the people of St. Paul. And 6,500 people petitioned before this ordinance was put in place to say, we don't want this to be implemented until we have a referendum. And the city council decided to not listen to the people of St. Paul. So I'm voting no because the contract itself, it was, was implemented um, um, unjustly, and it's not a contract for the people, and it will never be the contract for the people because the people never agreed to have this contract put into place. Re another other reasons why I'm voting no on this is because the contract itself is unfair. It takes equity out of uh, the, the, the principle of doing this contract was to bring equity across St. Paul. It, it does not do that. For those who were sharing carts and did not have to pay as much as they're paying today, it takes the equity away from them. For those who did not produce any waste, zero, zero wasters, they have to have a cart that gets picked up every week or every other week that's empty. That's not equitable to them. For those who have a duplex, a fourplex, who only are who only needed one cart before, today 
they have to have four carts which take up the space of the alleyways and the streets and the trucks are coming down, picking up every single cart even though there's only one cart that has garbage in it. Waste of energy, waste of, 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 uh, of service that is uh, being paid by our citizens and they're, they're not getting their fair share. It's not equitable. Um, 6,500, let's, let's let that sink in. 6,500 residents petitioned for this to be put on the ballot and the city council ignored them and that's why I'm voting no on trash. Thank you. Thank you. Nelsie? <clears throat> so uh, first off, Councilmember Jane Prince, I commend you for all the things that you do. I read the article about trash, and you know I have a lot of respect for you about always standing up for the east side and making sure that people get their fair share, that like we actually have a voice in the east side. So I want to say thank you to that, because when I read what you wrote, um, well, you know your quote, it actually reflected so much of what I believed in. Like I'm actually one person out of tens and thousands of people who are going to be voting at this. And like, you know, really this vote is up to people. Um, Greg, hold on. <laughs> and and I and I want to share that I want to share that like the for me like I'm a huge huge supporter of organized trash. I'm a huge supporter because I believe in our city actually always moving to a, a cleaner greener city and like you know organized trash is actually how we get there and like how it's how it's the contra contract is right now. It's not going to. And like, to be honest, you know, the, the, with the conversations that I have, the vast majority of people who I have actually talked to at the doors, you know, in, in my over one year long campaign, people are expressing to me that, hey, Nelsie, like we're really struggling here and we need somebody who's actually gonna fight for us. And like that's that's you know well, where I gravitate towards because I talked to you earlier about being you know running a, a campaign that's like people centered and like you know that's actually actually where I stand like I am a bit since day one of my campaign I have actually been talking about having shared out options um, shared or opt out options in the contract we don't have that right now I've talked about families being able to have different uh, bin sizes because not all of us actually need the same bin size. And, and like these are actually things I want to get done. Um, and I know that you know it's gonna it's at, you know for me in my campaign I'm actually still having conversations with people around trash. But I know that for you know honestly right now like I actually I actually do not have an answer for you on how I'm going to vote because my campaign is actually about people. But I know for sure that for me like the con the contract right now does not work. And I want to share that you know as someone who is running for city council my vote is actually leaning more toward the no vote. I have so many. Uh, progressive supporters in my campaign who come and help every single day, who talk about a racially equitable, equitable, uh, equitable community who want organized trash, and they're like, Nelsie, like we we support you, and like you know the, the only the only hard thing right now is that you know organized trash is something that isn't working for us, but you know we're still here supporting you. We, you you we know that you're actually someone who's committed to making changes in our contract that we need later on. That's something that I'm I am here fighting for, and I I want to say that you know to everybody out there you. You know, I, I, it's a very contentious issue, but for me, you could definitely count on me to be at the front line to make sure that we actually uh, renegotiate a contract that looks like what we want it to look like. Alexander? I'm actually encouraging everyone to vote no uh, in the city of St. Paul uh, on that trash referendum. Uh, the reason being is um, because I strongly believe in transparency, I strongly believe in inclusion, um, both in which were completely absent uh, uh, from that implementation process. I, like many of you all, uh, we want to see less trucks on our roads. Uh, we want to uh, see a, a, a cleaner environment, uh, but the problem is the implementation process. I think if we can get back to the drawing board, uh, understand what that process looks like to get there, and then move towards measurable solutions together, I think we'll be better off overall. Thank you, and Terry? I'm gonna be contrary to what everyone said, and I'm actually voting yes. Right, I'm voting yes because uh, because the environmental protection for uh, folks. I'm also voting yes because the less trucks on the road. I walk my kids to their bus stop every morning. I pre this morning just the one truck de uh, that was picking up trash in my neighborhood delayed the school buses. There was also construction on the street, and so I can't imagine if we added uh, went back to the old system and added some more trucks. That being said, I do talk to people at the doors, and I do understand that they're fixed on fixed incomes. Many folks in the on the east side and ward 
Ward 6 are experiencing our, new, our newly retired folks, our seniors, our folks who don't have a whole lot of money. So I think there are, is an opportunity in the contract to negotiate it. And I also do, uh, the, and the increase right now that you know people feel like it's a scare tactic, but realistically, um, and, and suddenly people wanna talk about the contract and they know all the like, contract language, and I'm not willing to take that risk with everyone else's money, frankly. And so um, the reality is we do have a contract. It's not perfect. It is, uh, you know, there is a lot of work to do that we can, um, where we can adjust pieces. But I don't know about you, but I don't know if you've ever tried to get out of a cell phone contract or a contract of any other uh, or, uh, piece. I really, really doubt that it's going to be considered an act of God because there was a referendum and we would have to go to court. And I am willing to not take that risk if we lose as a city. That's actually going to be more of our money that we're going to be spending to deal with those issues. Um, I, um, let's see. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my next question, all right, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask you to be as brief as possible because I do want to allow folks to have at least a little bit of, of a closing statement. Um, climate change has becoming much and much more of an issue and especially at the local level. Um, I'm asking you um, what you know about the Climate Action and Resiliency Plan, if you agree with it, and what you might improve on it if there are things that you think are inadequate. And let's see, um, this time why don't we start with Mr. Copeland. Great. Yeah, you know what folks, uh, the Climate Action Plan, that's great. You know, if you're over there and McAllister Groveland, if you're in Highland. Uh, but you know, over in my neck of the woods, they want to put a concrete bus road through our Bruce Vento nature trail. I'm not for that. They want to spend $400 million, they being the county, and some people up here, Terry. You know, honestly, that is no favor to the environment. It's no favor to our budgets. And it's misplacing the priority that we need to place on how we use our road money. So there's number one. Number two, we spend uh, something on the order of $27 million uh, with the city on giving them fees. I call it a tax, a franchise tax, for uh, gas and electric service. And frankly, you know, we've got a lot of people in this city that don't have a lot of money. A lot of senior citizens, a lot of poor people of all different colors. And some of those people happen to be white as well. And you know what? We need to do something for them. And we can do something besides talk about the environment and, and helping people uh, adjust within their income. We can exempt the poorest people in our city from paying that tax. And we can do that with a matter of policy. It's, it's a tax that's levied by the city. We don't have to check with the legislature. It's a tax that we levy at the city. Another one, number three. We have a right-of-way maintenance charge the city's been collecting for years. And what do they do with it? Oh, they just stick it in the general fund. They collect it on your water bill. Very clever people at the city. $4.50 a quarter. Well, you know what? We've got a problem in our little city. We've got some people that have lead water pipes going to their homes. Does anybody know what happened in Flint? Does anybody know what happened in Newark, New Jersey? We do not need to be collecting money for no purpose. And we have a very good way to use this money, and that's eliminating those lead connections to these homes. And frankly, if we don't do that, then we are setting up a dual standard, one for the poor people that have the lead pipes, and one for the, oh, the people who must work for corporations. Uh, I hear that all the time up here. Uh, you know, that don't have lead pipes because they can individually go to the water company, uh, our, our St. Paul uh, water utility, and get that fixed on their own. But I'm thinking we need a community solution. And we don't need another 30 pages and another 50 meetings about the climate change on that subject. We need to do some things in St. Paul to help the people whose climate has changed right under their very feet. Are we willing to do anything concrete for people as opposed to just talking about it? Mr. Basori? So we're talking about the CARP plan, the Climate Action Resiliency uh, Plan. 
that the city put in, uh, it's in the draft right now, it's not um, put into action. I believe um, it's a good f step forward for the city of St. Paul, but I, I do believe it's heavily um, um, corporate hand where Excel Energy has a lot of say and they put this plan together for the city of St. Paul. Um, I think we should uh, make sure that we revisit this with community voices. Um, I believe in um, energy democracy where we can put some power into the communities and the neighborhoods that um, are using this energy. So having solar, uh, solar, uh, solar um, um, panels that are co-ops owned by municipals and uh, uh, by neighborhoods that can share that power um, with the vacant lots that we have and many other things. So again, going back just to the car plan, um, since we're very short on time, um, I don't believe it's a good plan right now, but we can make it better with having everybody's voice put into this instead of just having a plan that Excel Energy just made for us and said, this is the plan. I think you should, in, you should put this into play when it's not, it's their interest, not our interest. It's not the interest of the people of St. Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Nelsie. So I want to share that to me, this is like a, a climate action is very urgent. Um, and as a racial equity organizer, one of the most frustrating things is having to really acknowledge that when we talk about the injustices of climate hitting our communities, um, Ward 6 and Ward 6 is one of the wards that will actually be hit the, the most um, and the hardest. And that's because we live in a system that has just been systemically um, built to leave out people who live in poverty and people of color. And like that uh, deeply represents what Ward 6 looks like, where we are one of the most beautiful, diverse communities, but also battling the highest levels of poverty in our city. And this is why, to me, it's so urgent to, for us to actually have someone who is bringing this to the forefront, someone who is very grounded uh, in, in what is in the current condition of, uh, of our communities and someone who's actually going to speak up about it. I say this because we have so many homes in the east side that are that have lead paint um, and like families and children who don't even know it. Who, you know, for me, uh, just like when I was a little girl growing up, I always thought that the things around me were very normal and that I was like actually living the best quality of life. Um, and those were huge lies um, painted to me. Um, and, and, you know, until it was me like, you know, busting that bubble and, and actually uh, starting to learn more about our systems and making change to change that to, to, to change those systems. It was when I realized that you know we, uh, it actually is going to take a whole collective of people coming together to correct these injustices. Um, and you know, I, in addition, I want to talk about air quality as well. Like in the air, air quality in the east side and water quality is one of the poorest that we've seen in St. Paul. These are these are uh, health conditions or these are like urgent health issues that need to be addressed. And the the, the plan right now. Doesn't, doesn't meet that need. We need our city council, we need stakeholders, uh, uh, different district councils, community leaders who, who you know, are experts at this because they love, love digging into climate justice and have already taken action on these things. We need them to, to be coming together and, and creating bolder solutions. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is uh, holding corporation, corporations accountable to actually investing in our communities. We need to, to um, uh, write letters and also push uh, verbally, you know, and inside meetings as well, push for Excel Energy to actually be divesting from fossil fuels. Um, so that our community in St. Paul here, we could actually be uh, dependent on renewable energy that looks like solar, uh, solar panels. Um, and there's so many more resources as well. Uh, yeah. Nelsie, because we've only got a couple more minutes. Sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like, I think that th those are the big ideas that we could actually push for. But the other one is that we need a, a council member who will work directly with people and different organizations to push and make sure we have funding to be able to renovate and like uh, and and. Um, and make changes right now to the community um, directly. And, and that's something that I will be working um, heavy towards. Thank you. Alexander. Absolutely. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, the city has over 150 uh, vacant lots right now via the HRA program. Um, many of these slots, uh, we can already begin to work towards a more clean environment, uh, uh, using those blighted properties to implement solar panel, uh, uh, excuse me, solar gardens, uh, community gardens, rooftop gardens, really big in the at, um, uh, hydroponics and aquaponics and allow those things to uh, work for itself. Uh, 
something of interest of mine. Uh, pertaining to uh, the Climate Action and Resilience uh, Plan, uh, quite frankly, I don't believe that it's truly reflective of who we are as a community right now. Um, uh, one thing that it alarms me and it seems so small that's not included in there is um, doing away with the use of plastic bags in retail stores citywide. These are things that we can do right now. I believe that if we can muster the resources to uh, do away with smoking in bars and restaurants, then certainly we can do away with, excuse me, we can muster the resources to do away with the use of plastic bags in retail stores citywide. Um, excuse me. Um, I don't believe that the, uh, the plan currently uh, reflects a preservation of our prized waterways and green spaces. Um, for instance, um, the, um, we got the rush line coming through uh, Ward 6. Um, that line um, is going to be detrimental to a whole community. Okay, It's going to be detrimental to a portion of our environment. Um, I don't like it. Um, Many other individuals don't like it, and I think that uh, we should uh, reevaluate how we're spending those dollars. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. And Terry. I, I do think uh, within the climate resilience, the resiliency plan, it, the key is about implementation, right? And so, and part of it too is implementation at the local level. There's a lot of people, uh, a lot of folks um, who are already doing things like planting uh, gardens, making bee safe yards. I see a lot of these when I walk around the east side. There are efforts that folks are already doing that I think we need to talk about more. I also think in terms of climate resiliency, we also need to make sure that we're prepared to connect with our neighbors in the cases of when we do have um, extreme weather events. I, I said it a story last week at the Environmental Forum. I was out without power one weekend, and it was just like super hard for my family, right? We had to throw out food, you know, we had to, um, you know, like go get flashlights. And so all these things, you know, for some families is an extreme additional cost. We at least were fortunate to have family members that live nearby. So I think the idea of like phone trees and some old school ways of knocking on our neighbor's doors is really helpful to battle against these um, extreme, uh, soon to be extreme weather events, uh, some of which are happening this weekend possibly. <laughs> so. Um, uh, uh, the this, this snow that's coming. But I think part of it too is to say, uh, is to do things at a city level of talking about planting more trees and making sure um, they become tree canopy and cover the roads so that the roads are not so hot. I also think this issue of the rush line, we are a transit isolated community on the east side. And so to say that we're not gonna offer more transit options, which by the way, reduces greenhouse gases, um, is uh, that we don't need it is, uh, is incorrect. And so I have been sitting on the rush line advisory committee. I went and door knocked the neighbors by there. They're concerned about what's happening as they should be. And I think again here, it's about communication and communicating with people what's gonna be key and happening in our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't really have time for, for closing statements, so I'd just like you each to repeat your names, and I would also like you to, to take one issue, so literally one or two words, that is really your top concern. And um, let us start with Alexander. I can't do it in one word, I'm sorry. I'm gonna blame it on special ed. Um, <laughs> The fact of the matter is, it's the first time in 23 years that we're going to have new representation on the east side, so it's imperative that we select an individual that has the ability to implement and embrace policies that adequately reflect who we are as a community and, quite frankly, abolish those that do not. My name is Alexander Bourne. I am running for St. Paul City Council, Ward 6, which covers much of East St. Paul. It's the community that I grew up in. It's the community that I love, and I would love to have your first or second vote on November the 5th. Thank, Thank you. you. Nelsie. Hi, everyone. I'm Nelsie Yang, and I'd say affordable housing is one of the most important things to me as somebody who experienced losing our, our family home to, uh, to foreclosure during the recession. It's something that I don't ever want to see happen to any other person, and I know that we have working families in the east side, and we need a champion for them. Um, and I also want to share That's that. That's one thing. Oh, okay, one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, my name is Kasim Basuri. I feel the hunger of the Eastsiders uh, to be heard, and I will fight for them. I would appreciate your vote on November 5th uh, as your first choice, and will do my best to be your public servant. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Copeland, please, if you do nothing else, vote no on this trash thing. Take out the trash on November 5th. 
There's a lot of trash to be taken out. Save money now because otherwise you're going to be paying $589 more every year. This is the time to say no, folks, because you got some people up here that aren't sure they're even going to vote. You know. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Vote thank no. Hi. <laughs> Yes, thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. Terry Tao, care a lot about economic development and growing our tax base. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your indulgence. And thank you for being here tonight. And we'll be back in five minutes. Welcome back to the St. Paul Strong Candidate Forum for City Council. We're now with Ward 7. Um, again, all of the candidates for City Council were invited. And here are the two that we have tonight for Ward 7. I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves and also to talk about what their vision is for the city and for the ward and what their top priorities are. All right, ladies. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Kurt Tumul. Um, my priorities as far as running for city council is to educate, empower, and elevate. And what does that mean? It means educate my ward, because the people in my ward, one thing that I'm starting to realize is a lot of people do not understand how their city works. So in order for us to have a, a vibrant city, we need to make sure that all residents of our city knows exactly how they're being affected. Um, also, I don't remember what was the other question, I'm sorry. It's, well, what is your vision? So ideally, if this city and your ward were working perfectly, what are the things you would most like to see and work on? Well, as far as my vision, it will be a, a developed space. As we all know, my ward especially has is lacking a lot. It's lacking um, a lot of development. It's lacking um, homes for the residents in the neighborhood. It's, it's lacking a lot. So just being able to create a vibrant war where people are, um, are, are in tune with what's going on in their city to help make it a better space for everybody. Thank you. Well, thanks for that question. Um, back when I was running for the first time in 2015, I talked to a Somali dad um, who I had met for the first time and I asked him what his community needed from the city and he said my community needs the same thing your community needs and that is a city that makes all of our children helps all of our children be healthy and successful and I thought a lot about that after I talked to him and I thought, if that was the, the mission or vision of our city to make all of our kids healthy and successful, I think everything else would flow from that and we'd have a very forward-facing, prosperous economy. If we're, if we're looking out for the kids, everything else will flow from that. So. And do you want to say about your priorities to make your vision a reality? Well, um, I guess my priorities are, um, I have, at Khartoum and I live in one of the most multicultural, diverse parts of the city. And as Khartoum mentioned, housing is a huge issue and good living wage jobs. So I think those are obviously two really important priorities as we move forward. Wonderful, thank you. And I'd like each of you to say, what is it that is unique about you, unique about your experience, or unique about your approach that you think would make you um, successful? Do 
I always start first? <laughs> no, here we go. I start. Would you like to? Yes, do you want to go in there? Get a minute to think yes, about it. Yeah, sure, I go think for it. Actually, we're supposed to all. We are. In we are. Fairness. In Although fairness, with only two. If Kartuma would always go first. <laughs> all right. Um, no, I think um, what uniquely qualifies me. I guess a, a couple of things. I. I have worked in city government, which I think Kartumu could argue maybe isn't a great strength. That I, um, I kind of came up through local government, but I, I got my first job in St. Paul working in the Latimer administration. And I think for anyone who recalls the Latimer administration, it was a really wonderful time for St. Paul where I learned from George Latimer that, that you can really try anything and accomplish any number of things at the local level if you work together. One of those things that George did was he had this operating philosophy called the homegrown economy. And similarly to where we are now, we had just gone through the energy crisis in the early to mid-70s. And Latimer decided that he wanted to work with all of our neighborhoods and, and business associations and work on making us locally self-reliant. And it was an amazing time to be in city government. The other experience I had was I, I got to be a council aide for 10 years with Jay Beninov. And, um, and that was extraordinary because Jay really had me function as a partner with him, and together we could get tons done, as, as I like to think Stephanie and I do. Stephanie Harris is in the audience, I believe, my legislative aide. But we were able to get a lot done, and also, Jay used mediation in neighborhood conflicts, predominantly in, in difficult zoning cases, and it was, it was an amazing thing to, to work with him for 10 years and to see that in most of our really divisive zoning issues, we were able to bring people together to, to listen to each other and to arrive at a plan, a future plan that reflected the needs of both. So recognizing that in a zoning case, it, you're always going to be neighbors, and if you have a divisive issue that makes you enemies, it's going to be for a long time. Um, we were able to overcome that and really work on some mediated issues. So, Thank you. Kartumu. Well, um, I came to Minnesota at the age of seven from Liberia, and just learning the history, I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to fight for people and make the right the wrongs rights, I guess. So I got a full scholarship to the U of M and I was at College of um, Liberal Arts. I did a year and soon realized, soon became homeless because I didn't know if you weren't taking summer classes, you couldn't stay on dorm. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Duluth to I, I, with plans to transfer to UMD. In the process, I got pregnant. So I was like, well, I'm in charge of a human being now, so I had to pull school on the back burner. I thought it was one of the, looking back at it now, I thought it was one of the worst choices I could have made as I went through life, but um, I've somewhat, some way came back full circle because I have my kids, and then I had the opportunity to um, be exposed to, I had a lot of trials and tribulations with dealing with government. And then I was fortunately to be exposed to opportunities to, for me to see how government impacts people and how the levels, how it works. So with that understanding and with the things I have experienced me myself, I realized that there is others, or and I know others that are going through the same things. And I seen that um, the way our government is working right now, and probably has been working for a while, it has been a lot of 
abuse of power. And when I say abuse of power, the people who have the power, are, they somewhat, I guess, forgot that they're supposed to be serving the people. They forgot what their job was. And so they make it difficult for other people to have the opportunities because they're not engaging the people. They're not even letting the people know that those opportunities are available. And some people are choosing who they want to give the opportunity to. And so it's, it's not, it was not being fairly given out to everybody. So being in the spaces that I've been in and learning the things that I have been, that I, I have learned, I feel like I could do this job very well as a city council member because one thing about me, I engage everybody. I engage people. I meet people where they are, I listen to people, and I understand just because um, we, we don't agree on something doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, you know, so. And I think that's all good qualities that a city council rep for a specific ward, especially Ward 7, should have. Understanding the people and working hard to make sure that the people are getting what they need to succeed. Thank you. One of the um, top concerns of St. Paul Strong is transparency, uh, transparency in government. And what are specific ways um, that you would make sure that decisions that happen at the City Hall are transparent? And what are specific ways that you would use to engage the community? Community engagement is a big thing to me. I think everybody should know what's going on in their city, how it affects them, and what they can do or say to help make the city better. So as far as community engagement, for some reason I think people think putting stuff on the internet is community engagement. Everybody don't have the internet. Everybody do not have the internet. So community engagement is really knocking on the doors, getting to know the people in the community, what makes them, what their likes are, their dislikes, like really being with the people and understanding the people. So that's one thing that I plan on doing is really being in my ward, understanding the people, grocery stores, whatever, talking to the people. And then another thing is actually um, hearing their voices you know, and listening to their voices and making sure that you're doing what they're asking you to do. So having any decisions that's being made, I would have the people know what's, what's going on, listen to what they're saying, and then take that into account when I'm making a decision on their behalf. Thank you. Transparency and what it means to me. Yes, and how do you see yourself going forward being accountable and ac accessible to the folks in your ward. Yeah. Um, I, I've really appreciated the role that St. Paul Strong has played in calling for transparency in city government. Um, the, a good example of that is when we were looking at changes to the charter that would have allowed the city to levy an administrative fine in certain kinds of um, city viol code violations. And I was just kind of rolling along, being busy with my work, and I got a call from uh, two constituents in my ward, one who I knew well and the other who I was hearing from for the first time saying, you're not gonna vote for that, are you? And I realized that, that I, I really hadn't paid attention to it the way that I should have. And um, so I met with each of them, and uh, one of them wrote an amazing editorial, and, and I believe it was co-authored. She ended up take, bringing it to St. Paul Strong, and um, it was co-authored by St. Paul Strong, and it raised a whole bunch of questions about what is the city thinking that we're gonna make this very broad charter change that could have a huge impact on any number of violations that could, it, it had the potential um, to hurt people who might not be able to afford 
to have an administrative levy fined. And in any event, um, not to go in, belabor the details here, um, as a result of the editorial being placed, the council just kind of very quietly backed away from it. And, and now it's being very carefully researched and it's gonna come back and it's gonna be much modified. I, you know, I try to be available all the time to everyone. As Kartumu notes, um, you can you can start to feel like if you're if you're engaging with people on email and on Facebook and on the internet that that's true community engagement, but it isn't. And um, so I try to be as many places as I as I can be and connecting with people as much as I can. And I think ultimately for me, transparency, um, you know, I, I kind of cheated Kartumu because I heard the question being asked of, a, of the, an earlier candidate forum. And I, and I think what transparency means to me is a, is a clear process for inclusive decision making at the public level. And we need to do a better job of it at the city. I think, I think we're hearing what Strong is saying. I think we're hearing a lot of the criticism that we're getting, but obviously not enough. So one of the most uh, divisive issues is obviously on the ballot that has to do with the trash situation. And I'm just wondering um, if you're going to vote yes, if you're going to vote no on the ballot, and um, if if the no vote prevails and there is an opportunity to renegotiate the contract, what are the parts that you think really need to be renegotiated? You know, that's a multi-part. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Um, okay, I, a couple things. First of all, I voted no on the trash contract in November of 2017 for, for a few reasons. One, it was too expensive, especially for people on fixed income and low income renters in two to four unit buildings. It didn't provide any incentive for waste reduction. And before we had even voted on the contract, waste management had bought out four of the 15 haulers. So it was easy to see that we were on the road to having waste management become a monopoly trash hauler by default. And sure enough, we're only a year into the contract and they have now bought out nine of the 15 haulers. We're down to six and nationally they're buying out advanced. So we are, we are on the road to having waste management as our hauler. If we were gonna start with that, if, if we knew that the large hauler, that a large multinational mega hauler was gonna end up being our hauler, we could have done a straight bid and saved the community a whole bunch of money. Um, but in terms of how I'm gonna vote, and I was very influenced, Elizabeth, by the editorial that you had in Sunday's paper, in which um, you said, if, we're, if we can renegotiate this contract, why aren't we doing it right now? And I, I, I actually had a, a constituent at the door ask me the same question on Friday afternoon. Um, this business, I, one of my colleagues said in the paper, post-litigation and post-referendum, we will work on bringing everybody to the table to renegotiate. And I called the Holland Consortium today. I mean, in terms of, we obviously couldn't talk about any legal issues, um, but I did call today and say, I think we should try to come up with something before the election. And, um, and we had a productive conversation. I, I don't wanna get anybody's hopes up about it, but your point of saying, if we're gonna negotiate it, stop acting like we'll do it after everybody votes. It's, it's so disingenuous. There's no reason we can't be trying to do it now. 
attempts to renegotiate it this year have not gone anywhere. So that's another point. In terms of how I'm going to vote, I had said in Min Post that um, because I've already had a chance to vote on this a few different ways, including on, on um, September 25th, I voted against the levy referendum that included 17.4% for trash. Um, because I don't think we should be putting it on the property tax if the vote is no. I think no should mean no. And I've appreciated what I've heard tonight from people talking about 6,400 citizens said, we don't want this and we should have a voice. So although I said I wasn't going to come out with a position um, and let the voters decide, I am definitely leaning no. Um, and so that's where I am right now. Two more. The question is, um, which way would you vote on the trash referendum, either yes to keep it or no to get rid of it? And if you had a chance to renegotiate it, um, what are the things that you would like to renegotiate? What things would you change about it? Well, I will vote no because Somebody's trash is their business. It's not the city's business. But as far as renegotiating, I will listen to have the people um, say what they want renegotiated because this trash thing has gotten our city really, really upset. I like the fact that people were organized and was able to take their um, case where it needed to be, where it needed to go, and get the um, outcome that they wanted. And I don't know if it's really the outcome that they wanted really, but because now we still gotta vote on it. So, but I don't think this, I don't think the um, city should be telling people who can pick up their trash. That's, and now this has cost us a bigger problem because now we gotta figure out how we're going to get this, how we're going to make the residents, you know, feel a little bit more secure. So it's going to be a lot of talking to people and seeing what they feel will work for them. Because even today, as I was door knocking, a lady explained to me that her, and it was her and her husband and the neighbor, him, her and her husband, and they used one trash can because it was only four people, you know, and now... They're spending more money using less trash. So you're really going to have to make sure that the people are at the table and get their viewpoint on what's going to make this situation better at the state that we're in now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question about the Climate Action and Resiliency Plan. And I'm just wondering what you both think about it. And if there are things that you are th that you believe are not up to scratch or that could be improved, and how you would like to see it improved, I don't know which of you would like to go first. I could go first, but um, could you tell me a little bit about the plan? I'm sorry. Sure. The Climate Action and Resiliency Plan is in draft form. And it's basically a plan that will show how we will deal with climate change and energy policy. And it encompasses looking at our transportation system, like do we need to, in do we need to increase the amount of bus routes and transit so that we can decrease the amount of cars that we're using? It includes things like um, how can we make buildings more efficient so that people can stay warmer in the winter and pay less for their energy bills? It's, um, um, it's looking at things like tree cover and how can we have plant more trees and make our city um, both more beautiful and also deal with some of the, the pollution and carbon dioxide. So there are a lot of different pieces to it. And it also looks at things like renewable energy and where can we put um, solar panels. Okay. So 
What do I think about the plan? Mm -hmm. and what's the other? And, and what are the things that you think would be important to have in the plan and um, to keep in the plan? And if there are any other things that you can think of that you think should be added to the plan? Okay, so I guess we are the human beings that create the problem. So first, educating the people on how they are affecting the situation. Um, I know you said, Edu educating the people on how they they can affect the situation because um, it's the things that we do that are causing this. Um, holding incentives like the cars, giving the electric cars and um, the what is it? Plug in the electric cars. Yep. You, you know, you got it. Yeah, giving mm -hmm. them incentives if they make more of those um, vehicles for us. Um, and also, I was reading something about cell phones, you know, um, the production of cell phones being a problem. So um, get, taxing those people a little bit more, you know, or taking something from them to help figure out how we gonna solve this issue to help solve the issue. Um, and I, I think it's more so just educating people because if you, tell somebody, well, if you could go a different route and um, that's gonna save you, save some carbon, you know, save some gas from going up in the air and it's gonna leave a better life for your child. I'm like, okay, well, I might ride a bus today or I might ride a bicycle, you know? So just educating people on how they are making our, our world worse for the generations that are coming and then help them figure out how to implement different tools to help us, you know, not use so much, you know, mm -hmm. to help with the climate change situation. Thank you. Um, I am, I, I have um, looked at the draft climate and resilience plan and I maybe don't know it as well as I should, but I have the, the, um, I've had the opportunity to meet with the group called St. Paul 350, uh, St. Paul chapter of Minnesota 350, which is committed to, um, to, to trying to fix the climate crisis. And one of the things that is clear to me is that in talking to St. Paul 350 is that the draft climate and resilience plan sets some good goals in terms of um, when we would be um, carbon free. Um, but one of the things that, that they called to my attention was the role that Excel Energy has played in being part of that plan. And Excel's really one of the leading um, utilities in the country in terms of the work that they've done with renewables and setting ambitious goals. But one of the things that the draft climate plan allows for is Excel's plan to build gas fracking plants on its way to moving entirely to renewables. And I, I think, I'm, I'm certainly no expert on this, but it seems clear that we've gotten far enough with renewables now that we don't have to go through one extra fossil fuel step of plant production to frack gas. Um, I think the other frustration I have is that while the Climate and Resilience Plan does set good goals, we are really dragging our feet on moving ahead with community solar gardens. And um, we're working with the public schools and trying to get uh, a school or two that we could do a um, community subscription solar garden. And I, I feel like we're kind of saying all the right things, but we're not moving quickly enough. We're not, the urgency needs to be there. I'm also really um, pleased to be aware of the work of the Citizens Climate Lobby and the, um, the 
carbon fee and dividend program, which sounds like something, it's now there's a bipartisan bill in Congress that would move us in that direction and would do a couple of things, which is reducing CO2 emissions to pre-1990 levels and um, recycling revenue that could be used for economic growth and job creation. So I'm really excited about being part of trying to move forward some legislation that really brings about change. And I think the city just needs to, to ramp up the urgency on these, these ideas. Well, thank you both very much. I'm told, I was told probably about a minute and a half ago that we had two minutes left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I am hoping that both of you can repeat your names and just say um, maybe what your, your top priority, your top priority, um, should you be elected and for you going, going forward, should you be reelected? What your top priority, your name and top priority? My name is Kurtumo King, and my top priority is educating the people in my ward, empowering them so that they know how, that they understand their city, and they understand how their city works for them and what they can do to empower themselves. Thank you. And I'm Jane Prince, and my top priority, if I am lucky enough to get a second term, is to really ramp up our efforts to create housing for all income levels and to ensure that no St. Paul child has to experience the trauma of homelessness. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much um, to the candidates, to the audience for being here, and for the folks who will be watching this at home, and of course to SPNN for uh, taping the whole program. Thank you. Thank you.